Good morning. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Grace Galvin, and I handle programming for the Vanderbilt Project on Unity and American Democracy. Uh, the project is hosting today in partnership with both Vanderbilt and Belmont Law Schools. Um, we're very excited to have you all here today, and welcome to our virtual audience as well. I am just going to give some very, very brief introductions, and then we're going to dive right in. Um, on our our far right, we have uh, Judge Gonzalez, former Attorney General, obviously, also served in the White House during President Bush's administration. Then we have Jan Crawford. She is Chief Legal Correspondent for CBS News. She has covered the Supreme Court since, I believe, 1994, mm -hmm. if I have that right. Um, she's going to give us a great insight to the way that the media approaches covering the Supreme Court, the federal judiciary. Uh, very excited to have her here with us today. Then we also have Mr. Robert Bauer, Professor Bauer from NYU. He, is al he also served under President Obama's administration as his White House counsel. I believe he oversaw uh, Justice Kagan's nomination and confirmation process. Then as our moderator today, we have Professor Brian Fitzpatrick from Vanderbilt Law School. And uh, Professor Fitzpatrick, he served uh, as law clerk to Justice Scalia just before he also served on the Senate side as advisor to uh, Senator John Cornyn from Texas back in 2005 and 2006, uh, advising on Supreme Court <laughs> nomination and confirmations. Um, he will be leading our discussion today, and I'm going to pass the baton onto him and we can dive in. Thank you so much, Grace. It's an honor and pleasure to be here today. This is a very important topic, the United States Supreme Court. Let me begin by uh, reminding our audience of something that Alexander Hamilton had to say about the Supreme Court in the Federalist Papers. These were the essays, of course, that the founding generation wrote to try to persuade one another that the Constitution should be ratified. Alexander Hamilton said that the judicial branch has influence neither over the sword or the purse. All it has is judgment. And Alexander Hamilton said that to try to persuade people that the Supreme Court was, as he said, the least dangerous branch. That the only power the court had would come from its powers of persuasion. Well, I think it's fair to say that there are a lot of people today that are not persuaded. Uh, by the United States Supreme Court. There's a lot of criticism of the court, both for the things that the court does in its opinions and for things that the court uh, has suffered outside of its opinions. And so just to give you a few examples to kind of introduce our topic today, you know, we've had some leaks from the Supreme Court in the past year. Um, as we all know, a draft of the opinion uh, in the Dobbs case, the abortion case was leaked uh, to the press, and uh, uh, the Supreme Court has been under some criticism uh, for allowing that to take place. There was a more recent allegation of a leak from Justice Alito uh, that he told uh, some people several years ago what the outcome was going to be in a religious freedom case. People are criticizing the court based on that allegation as well. But there's also been a lot of criticism of some Supreme Court decisions. One I mentioned, the Dobbs decision, the abortion decision, uh, overruled Roe v. Wade, a 50-year-old precedent. There was another decision this past term about gun rights, uh, the Bruin case about a New York law that restricted whether you could carry a weapon in public. That law was over 100 years old, and the Supreme Court struck it down as unconstitutional. Uh, there's a case before the court right now that a lot of people are wondering whether the Supreme Court's going to overrule another precedent. It's uh, actually a pair of affirmative action cases, one from Harvard, one from the University of North Carolina. And you know, the question before the court is whether they should overrule their decision from a the early 2000s that said it was constitutional for universities to use racial preferences in their admissions. A lot of people think the court's going to overrule that precedent. So there's a lot of criticism of the court right now. 
There's a lot of calls for reform of the court. I think we're going to talk about all these things today. Uh, but before we get to reforms, I want to know from the panel whether we actually have a problem. Uh, is the criticism of the court well-founded? Is the court doing something wrong? Or is this just normal judicial behavior and normal judicial criticism? I think maybe I'd like to start with you, Judge Gonzalez. What do you think? Is something out of the ordinary here? I don't think it's out of the ordinary, quite honestly. Um, I know the polls show that the court is not very popular right now, but you know what? The other branches of government, if you poll the American public, they'd say, we don't think much of you either, Congress or the White House. Uh, so, and it's not surprising that there is going to be criticism. There, these cases that the Supreme Court takes, what, 60 to 70 cases a year, they're all, most of them are extremely controversial, consequential. Uh, and you're going to have disagreement. There's no question about it. Uh, you know, people criticize the court for making policy. Well, in applying the law, you're going to shape policy. So we're criticizing the court for doing its job. Uh, and so I, you know, uh, it's not like the Court of Appeals where you have some circuits uh, where the, the cases are un perhaps unanimous 90%, 95% of the time. Uh, there's going to be controversy because of the, the subject matter of the cases that go before the Supreme Court. I know there's disagreement about the way that the, the judges ought to be interpreting the Constitution. You know, let's face it, the Constitution does not say how it is to be interpreted. The Constitution does not say who's to interpret it. We accept the fact that the, the Supreme Court does the job of interpreting, and whether or not you, you know, however you feel about the way the court interprets um, the Constitution and the statutes passed by Congress, that's a matter of great debate, and I'm sure we can, we can talk about that during this session. Jan, what do you think? Is the Supreme Court doing something wrong? Is it fair to criticize it the way it's been criticized? Well, first of all, I thank you guys all so much for coming and for having us here to talk about this, and, and the, the Unity Project here at Vanderbilt is a terrific um, endeavor and certainly much needed, and now to be here we see um, does the Supreme Court need uh, some talking to about unity? Because it does seem like the court, like much of our society, is as divided uh, as it has ever been. Um, but I think, you know, again, part of, of what you're doing here at Vanderbilt with the Unity Project is keeping things in historical perspective, and that's really important. This country has been divided before. The court has been criticized before. Presidents ran campaigns uh, against the Supreme Court and billboards saying that the justices should be impeached you know, decades and decades and decades ago. So in some ways, I think to um, a judge, did you all call you judge or general? Al. Or dean? <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, to your point, um, the polls show that people are very upset about the court if you disagree with their decisions. So, you know, the court still has definitely taken a hit in the most recent public opinion polls like it did in 2004. Um, Wait, 2001. 2001 after Bush versus Gore. Uh, and then it kind of went back up again. So you have seen these ebbs and flows in public opinion of the court. I think what is troubling, what we see now, though, is that the polls show people have very polarized views of the court. So if you're conservative and you believe that this Supreme Court is finally embracing a method of constitutional interpretation that you support, then you think this court's doing a great job. If you're liberal and you're horrified that they are overturning uh, precedent that has been on the books for half a century, uh, you know, then, then you're, wait, did I say horrified? You're thrilled, and if you're liberals, you're horrified, and that's what's being reflected, I think, in some of the polls, a, a polarization about how people view the court. Why is that important? Going back to, to um, Alexander Hamilton, the court doesn't have an army. Uh, its decisions generally are uh, as a result of the American people agreeing uh, to follow the dictates of those decisions. They can't send the standing army out to go and enforce those decisions. So it is important that the court have that kind of con constitutional uh, integrity and acceptance by the public. Um, and that means it's important for the political branches and the media uh, to cover that institution fairly. Things that I, I actually, we can talk about later too. Bob, what do you think? Is this, is this court in, in trouble? Is it a is it a problem that it's got low approval ratings, that the approval is polarized in the way it is? You see this is a, a problem that needs fixing. 
Certainly, it is never helpful or healthy for any one of our major institutions to uh, suffer from distrust, public distrust, low approval ratings. Uh, as um, Attorney General Gonzalez has pointed out, other institutions are passing through the same period of uh, mistrust, and certainly the court's approval rating as historically, or I would say as relatively weak as it is right now compared to recent years, is certainly above the approval rating that Congress receives. So we'll start with that. <laughs> and the news media. And the news media, but I was, I was too graceful to say that, but thank you for okay. uh, But I certainly agree that we should be mindful of the historical perspective, if I may tout it. Uh, President Biden's commission on the Supreme Court of the United States has an entire chapter devoted to the history of conflicts over the court. The role of the court, particularly during periods when uh, the body politic or other governmental actors thought the court was intruding in inappropriate ways into decisions that should be committed to the body politic, to the public, uh, were highly critical of the court. Uh, we've had, obviously, debates over court expansion, court packing, depending on how you want to term it, and term limits in the past, and other reforms that were directed toward addressing problems in the way that the court operated. So this is something we've seen from the virtually the beginning of the republic. And the heatedness of these controversies uh, increases and decreases over time. I agree with Jan that what we're seeing now is certainly a reflection in public response to the court of the polarization that's afflicting the politics of the country overall. There's no question that that's true. There are some contributing factors that are unique to our period, like the nomination controversies of recent years and the way in which the court came to have uh, what is uh, often referred to as a six to three conservative majority. Uh, that has certainly been a factor. And then I'll just close by saying, I think there are reforms. That's what the commission report was all about, was the question of what kind of reforms would update the court's operations in light of contemporary requirements and help bolster public confidence in the court. But that's very tricky business. It turns out to be very complex. Even some of the reforms that are bandied about, uh, sometimes very generally, uh, like term limits, uh, turn out to be very complicated in conception and design, not to even mention matters like a court expansion. But in other areas where the court could take steps and where steps could be taken to improve the standing of the court, and I'm speaking, for example, of things like the way the court manages its emergency docket or questions of judicial ethics. There are incremental steps that I think that could be taken that would at least protect the court from some of the attacks that I think have taken a toll. You know, uh, your comments about the standing of the court in the eyes of the public reminded me of something that Justice Scalia said after the Supreme Court issued its opinion in Bush v. Gore so many years ago. And that was, you know, our legitimacy is not like a piece of armor that we put up on the shelf and leave there gathering dust. Our legitimacy is a piece of armor that every once in a while we need to take off the shelf and use in battle. And so, you know, one question is, should the Supreme Court care that its decisions are unpopular with some of the public? Uh, should the Supreme Court be focused simply on the law and how they think the Constitution should be interpreted? Or should they bend their decisions because they think the public would like them to do something different? You know, Bob, what do you say about that? I mean, you don't want the Supreme Court bending no, the public opinion, No, I wouldn't opinion, say bending. I, 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 my answer to that, I, I have to say, is yes and no, uh, which is uh, no, I don't think the court should surrender the rule of law to crass political considerations or poll what the likely public response would be to any decision that it might render. But I also think the court has to be thoughtful about when it may be straining uh, its credibility with the public. There seems to me to be some steps that it can take to be sensitive uh, to the pressures of the moment and to the toll that those pressures can take on the court's credibility. So it's difficult. I'm not going to suggest it's an easy thing to do. But I also don't think the court should be, and the court, frankly, in my judgment, has never been uh, indifferent to what's taking place outside uh, the chambers. Let me ask you guys this. Do you think the public is capable of understanding anything besides the results in a case? So as some of you have alluded to already, you know, the majority of the Supreme Court right now follows a philosophy called originalism, 
where they think that the Constitution should be interpreted according to the original understanding of the document until that document is amended. Um, does the public understand these debates over judicial philosophy, or do they only see, do I like the result, or do I not like the result, Judge? I think they are most concerned about the result, and they don't understand some of these interpretive methods, um, quite honestly. And I think that uh, um, there are ways, I mean, think about the public, who, who is, is the one, they're the ones that are polled, where do they get the most information about the Supreme Court? It generally comes from confirmation hearings. And so when you watch those episodes, um, it's not a very pretty picture. And it's not surprising that uh, people come away from those hearings thinking there's going to be a winner and there's going to be a loser. And that adds to the notion that the court has become politicized. Um, so I think for the public, what they care about is, is the outcome. It, it, in most cases. And they don't understand. For example, in the Dobbs case, uh, people think that the Supreme Court took away a, a woman's right to choose. That's not what that decision do does. Uh, the entity, the uh, organization that's taken away a woman's right to choose in the states around this country are the governors and the legislators. If people want that protection and through the Demo democratic process, you know, laws are passed, the co their constitutions are amended, then, the, then that right is protected. So I, just, I think people have, a, they, need to, they need to study the opinions and really have an appreciation of what, is this, what does this opinion do? And I think too often what they do is just read the headlines only and don't have a full appreciation of what the decision has been. One final point, I'm just get, getting back, I want to emphasize that I do think that the court needs to be concerned uh, about the confidence of the American public in the integrity of the court uh, and the way that, that they make decisions uh, I, we don't want to see a situation back in the 1950s where you, you have a court, you know, Brown v. Board of Education, we're going to de desegregate the schools, and the South ignores it. I think it, we're not in a good place when the court I issues a decision and those decisions are not followed, they're not abided by. But I, I, I'm just a little worried, I guess, that if the public can only understand the outcomes, then what can the court do? to enhance its legitimacy besides give the public the outcomes the public wants? I think there's a lot more that, that the court can do. They can go out and talk about at forums like this. I think the bar has a great responsibility and a great opportunity to educate the public about how the court operates, how the court makes its decision, quite frankly. And they need, they need to understand that, um, you know, the, the media, um, as tr hard as they, they might try, the, you know, they may not always present the complete story. I also need to understand that some of the, the, the acts that exist in this country is fomented by social media. There are countries around the world, quite frankly, that are not friends of the United States who benefit from that angst. If, if we are focused on what's going on in this country because of concern about a Supreme Court decision, then maybe we take our eye as a government, U.S. government, from what's going on in, in a country. So it's, that's... We just have to be careful where we, get, where we get our information about what the court is doing and why. So there's a lot of ideas in the mix now, Jan. So, you know, one question, I mean, you probably have your fingers on the pulse of the American people more than any of us up here because <laughs> of, of your work. And, and by the way, Jan has written a marvelous book that you should all read called Supreme Conflict. Christmas I, is just around the corner. <laughs> I, I, it's, it's a few years old now. You can find it I, in a bargain bin somewhere, I think maybe. it's still <laughs> one of the best books ever written about the U.S. Supreme Court. She's a much better writer than, than Jeffrey Tubin. So I think that That's you a low really... bar. Come on. <laughs> I really think that, that uh, it's, worth, it's worth picking up. But so, I mean, first of all, do you agree with this notion that I've aired, that the public can only understand results? And these debates about judicial philosophy or what's in the history, what's not in the history, are over the public's head. And so their view of the court is going to depend heavily on whether they simply agree with the result or not, number one. And number two, how do you see things like confirmation hearings or the media helping or hurting uh, the public's understanding of what the Supreme Court does? Um, wow, that's a lot to tackle. You might have to remind me of number two if I get down some country no road on number one. Um, I, I don't think we can blame the public uh, for not understanding that the court 
<coughs> and, and I agree completely with you, General. Like I spent at CBS News, I mean, I spent you know, weeks saying the Supreme Court is not taking away uh, a right to abortion. They're not banning abortion. That's, that, that's not what they're doing. Um, but I think, so I don't think you can blame the public. I mean, the court hands out decisions that are written for legal scholars and law professors that are 100 pages, hundreds of pages long. You know, there's a short little summary, but most people aren't going to read that. Um, I, th I think you have to look at the political process and the media, uh, because the political process, you, I completely agree with you, and maybe I'll just combine this with two, the confirmation hearings have become complete, not episodes, but circuses and sideshows that aren't about any kind of serious examination of judicial philosophy or constitutional interpretation. They're all gotcha, smears, trying to paint someone in the worst possible light. Uh, because it's gotten caught up in the political process and it's winners and losers. Uh, the media, you know, we, I have a minute 30, generally, minute 45, to explain a 150-page Supreme Court opinion with multiple dissents and concurrences. Uh, you're not going to, so I mean, I, I think that we can't, I think the public does want to know, the public does care about the court. It, everything that the court does touches on almost every aspect of American life. You know, our relationships, how we worship, our, the rules at our job, um, you know, it's, it's critically important. And it, it impacted the election. Um, people voted based on justices that they thought might be on the court, most recently in the midterm and then the previous presidential elections. <coughs> so, you know, I think that it's a mistake to say the pu it's over the public's head. Um, I think it's on us as journalists and people who are in the political process to do a better job of taking the courts, um, do, do a better job of presenting what the court is actually doing and not just presenting it as, you know, an Obama judge or a, a Bush judge, or which implies that that's politicized too. And so we've, we've talked a little bit already about what the court did and didn't do in this Dobbs decision. And, um, you know, I think it's, fair to say that, that Jan and, and the judge or the general uh, or Al uh, are right that the Supreme Court didn't say that you don't have access to abortion anymore. The Supreme Court said there's nothing in the Constitution that says you have a right to an abortion. So it's left to the legislatures of each state or maybe the US Congress if they want to get involved to decide how much access to abortion people have. So on the one hand, that's throwing an issue back to the political process, uh, taking it away from the judiciary. So you think that that might be a modest thing for the Supreme Court to do. Say, we're not going to decide abortion policy for America. We're going to let the democratic process do that. But on the other hand, the other thing the Supreme Court did is they did overrule a precedent that was 50 years old. And what does that do in terms of the court's legitimacy and the standing that it has in the public's eyes? Bob, do you see it as a problem when the court overrules its own precedent? It does so. Uh, it obviously has to be mindful of the significance of it doing so. It's not a, it's not a small step for the court, particularly for something that's sometimes been described as a super precedent. Uh, to overrule it. But again, to speak of the polarization of our politics, um, there's a large segment of the American public that applauds this and thinks it was long overdue. And there's a large section of the American public that thinks it was an atrocity, a default, a abdication by the court of its responsibilities uh, as an institution. And this goes back, and I couldn't agree more with, with Jan, to the question of how the American public understands what the court is doing in the debate about the court. I, I do think it is correct. It's very difficult to ask people to follow these abstruse arguments about originalism or, as Jan pointed out, the court has a syllabus that summarizes its decisions, and those aren't even necessarily something people are going to spend hours out of their day trying to puzzle through, much less get into the heart of the writing. Um, but their understanding of the institution, how it operates, and its motivation, and what it means to overrule a precedent, and whatever, all of that ultimately, I think, is absorbed from the political commentary around it in the media. And 
lobbying groups, mm -hmm. groups that are dedicated to try to move the court in one direction or another, that raise and spend huge amounts of money to shape public understanding of what the court is doing. And I think it's fair to say that some of these groups play a very constructive role, uh, and some of these groups play the role of inflaming opinion uh, by presenting, I think, very misleading pictures of what the court has done. Uh, you know, it's, I'm a Democrat, and I uh, uh, have my own views of uh, the outcome, not that all Democrats share them, of how the court, of, of particular decisions that the court has reached, but I, I definitely look at that loud noise around the court uh, as something we need to really look closely at in deciding why it is that the public comes to a conclusion um, or some parts of the public come to a conclusion that the court is in trouble and their approval of the court drops dramatically and even where they don't agree with the outcome of a decision because they are focused. I think uh, Attorney General Gonzalez is quite right. They're obviously concerned with the outcome. The outcome is what is most tangible in the press reports, what's most meaningful to them in hearing about the decision, that understanding how it is that the court might have arrived at that decision is shaped by a debate taking place outside the court, and it's not always a very constructive or responsible debate. Well, let me ask you guys this then, because you know, Jan has said you know, the media needs to do a better job. Um, you know, you've mentioned that... We could do know, a whole panel on that. <laughs> <laughs> <You've mentioned laughs> on a lot that, of topics. You know, outside groups inflame things. You know, the, the judge said the confirmation hearings are not helping. Uh, those are a circus. So let's just assume for the moment that no one's going to do a better job, that we're stuck with the job that we're doing right now. If I am a member of the public that wants to get an honest and truthful assessment of what the Supreme Court is doing, where is the best place that I could turn given the current landscape of information? Any, any thoughts from any of you on this? Where can the public go to get good information about the court that's not inflammatory? I think there's terrific uh, Supreme Court reporters who cover the court. Read a newspaper. Um, you know, I hate, I mean, I, I watch CBS News, you'll get a minute 45, but if you really want to understand uh, you know, the New York Times is a great paper. The Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, they have dedicated Supreme Court reporters who have been covering the court many, many years. Uh, and so I think it's a, the, the Supreme Court press corps is, is a, is, as a whole really an impressive group of journalists. But that is, um, you know, a one-day story. What I think, to, to Bob's point and, and to General Gonzalez's point, you know, it's, it's what happens after the news hits, right? And how that becomes absorbed into like politics. And so then it's, it's winners and losers. And, and so that's, I think the aftermath is kind of the carnage that we see and that's what lasts. That's when you throw that stuff, that's what sticks. Bob, Judge, do you agree with Jan that mainstream media is doing a good job of covering the court? I, did, I said the Supreme Court press court. Oh, I see. The Supreme Court press corps and the mainstream media, you guys are pretty happy with the job I, I think do? so, but I, but I think for the general public, it's going to take a little work, folks. I mean, you're going to have to, I, I would check out multiple sources, quite honestly, and not just depend upon one source. And I really do think that like forums like this one, and I think the bar has a responsibility to be out there. I think judges can be out there talking about what they're doing, how they do their work. Um, I think the public, there, there are opportunities for the public to get educated, but it takes some work and we're all pretty busy and, you know, so. Yeah. I, first of all, I, I do generally think, <clears throat> at least the, um, in the media organs that I'm familiar with, uh, networks like um, the one that Jan reports for and the major uh, sort of general news organizations post the Times, Wall Street Journal, do have reporters who are well versed in how the court operates and do a very good job of capturing what particular decisions, pending decisions, what issues they raise and do a very good job of explaining the outcomes. Um, I, I will say again, and I don't want to engage in horrible special pleading here, but the, I would recommend um, for people who really want to delve into it that at least as the question of reform of the court is an interest, I would definitely um, recommend the Biden Commission report. I didn't write it unilaterally, so I'm not touting my own product. There were 34 ideologically diverse 
uh, members of the legal academy, practitioners, in some cases um, uh, activists, who were involved in writing the Biden Commission report on the Supreme Court of the United States. And it attempts to portray, and I think this is what's so important, the complexity of some of these issues. Our tendency to polarize politics is to simplify everything, to simplify everything so that there's a powerful narrative that may appeal to one or the other of the competing uh, factions in this country. And the attempt of the president was to have a full rendering available to the public of the court in all of its complexity, which includes some of the difficulties that uh, we would have to confront in thinking about reform of the court. So I did want to, I wanted to plug it because I think it's as something that was produced in the course of six months, a very valuable resource for people who are interested in the court. It is a very valuable resource, and I do want to spend some time a little later on talking about some of the reform ideas that were um, at least raised by the report. Um, before we do, I want to talk a little bit about the confirmation process. And, you know, we, we can blame the senators for not doing a good job, but one of the criticisms that came out of the Dobbs decision was not of the senators, but of the justices themselves and what they told the senators during their confirmation processes. I heard from one of my colleagues, she told me that she thought that some of the justices had lied in their confirmation processes because they said that Roe v. Wade was a precedent, a super precedent that deserved great respect. And then they turn around at the first opportunity and overrule that precedent. And so I want to you know, ask the panel, do you think that the justices are a little bit to blame for misleading the public into their res uh, misleading the public to think that they respected precedent more than they actually did? I don't, I think you can make the argument that at the time, sitting in that chair, they believed that they would respect precedent. And in fact, um, candidly, all of our nominees were instructed, if you're asked a question about a case like Roe, of course, you, you know, you're going to, you respect precedent. But that doesn't mean, you know, you have people that are on this court for 10, 20, 30 years, and over a lifetime, your views change. Uh, you become smarter and wiser. And so lots of things happen during that time that may cause you to reconsider what you thought the time of your confirmation hearing was binding precedent. The court does make mistakes. And fortunately, they have the ability to rectify those mistakes by going a different direction. So I think it's possible to make those kind of statements in a confirmation hearing truly believing, yes, this is how, what I believe. What do you, well, what I mean, do you as think? appellate court judges, which they were when they were sitting in those chairs, it is binding precedent for them. They're they're obliged to follow the opinions of the Supreme Court. None of them said, but and when I'm a justice, I'm going to affirm that. They all refuse to answer those questions. Starting going back to to Justice Ginsburg. So I think this is a little kind of like you know, there's gambling in Casablanca. Like people are shocked that <laughs> Sam Alito and you know Brett Kavanaugh and Amy Coney Barrett. Uh, decided to overturn Roe versus Wade, those senators are really surprised about that. Well, then why didn't they vote for them? I mean, if they were so confident. So I, I think that you know those questions are what justices or nominees to be justices are always going to say. They don't want to bias, to, to present any kind of evidence that they're biased before they actually consider the case and look at the documents. That goes back to, the, it's called the Ginsburg rule. It goes back to, to you know Justice Ginsburg saying, you know, you know I'm not going to touch any questions that might raise issues about cases that come before me. Um, so then that asks, well, what's the point of confirmation hearings, right? Um, because they can't answer how they're going to rule. Well, it's very valuable. I agree with General Gonzalez that that is how people see uh, who Supreme Court justices are. The, their arguments aren't televised. Most of them, you know, most people never get to even see uh, an argument. You have to be in Washington, you know, two weeks out of the year, uh, out of the month that happened to be where the court's hearing arguments. So confirmation hearings can provide a really important way of, of introducing a nominee or soon to be justice to the American people and talking about the law and their views on the law. And, and to Bob's point, how, how they would like think about the Constitution. Do they, 
just that I believe that it's a, should be the original understanding, that's the conservative method, or should it be more of a living constitution, which is more of what the liberals believe? That's really important. Um, but it's become a complete sideshow. I mean, these confirmation hearings now with, I think you have to lay the blame a lot at the Senate Judiciary Committee, their staffs, the groups. Um, it doesn't serve that purpose at all. And in fact, it serves a negative purpose by kind of sowing the seeds that the court is just as political and corrupt as Congress is. And so that is, if you want to talk about reforms, I don't know how you ask, uh, I don't know how you would reform that, but I, I think that we've really gone off the rails um, in our confirmation process. As long past is the day when a nominee like Justice Ginsburg uh, or Justice Scalia uh, or Justice O'Connor could be confirmed, if not unanimously, then almost unanimously. Bob, what do you think about the confirmation process? Is it broken, and, and who's to blame if it is? <coughs> I think there's blame to go around, but again, we're back to um, a negative feedback loop that runs somewhat like this. The court uh, plays an extraordinary role in resolving major contentious issues in our society. So if that's the case, then it is going to be the focal point of its intense interest and the focal point of an intense battle for control. If that's the case, then it's not surprising that every Supreme Court nomination, particularly if control of the court is at issue, is going to turn out to be a battle royal. That's not at all surprising. Uh, now, would you prefer, uh, certainly I would, if the legislative process would rise above itself, if you will, <laughs> and still utilize, even with all those competing political pressures, utilize the confirmation process as an opportunity for a meaningful exploration of the role of the court? and the qualifications and the outlook of the justice, uh, a potential justice who's being nominated, yes, that would be better. But I don't think it's realistic to assume that that would happen. So the power of the court and the role that it plays in the society necessarily feeds into the way the confirmation process itself works. The other thing I want to say about justices and you know, who lies and who didn't and you know, as you know, there's a lot of opportunistic reasoning about this. You know, Democrats are convinced that Republican nominees lie, and Republicans are convinced that Democratic <laughs> nominees lie. Um, there's a fair amount of motivated reasoning. But the confirmation process is so merciless that the, uh, and, and I'm sure uh, General Gonzalez, having been White House counsel, and, and Jan, with her experience, I'd be interested in their views. I, I'd be surprised if they disagreed. There is a definite pressure on the justices as there are potential justices as they're being prepared for their hearings to avoid any possible mistake, any slippage in the way that they answer a question. So you can imagine, for example, a commendable response by a nominee on the, say, rep reproductive rights jurisprudence who says, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a conservative and I, I have concerns about the ever-expanding uh, court-generated rights. Um, but I do recognize that Roe versus Wade is super precedent. I'm going to take that very much into consideration, but it'll depend on the case that comes before me, and I'm going to take a fresh look once I'm on the court. Any White House counsel, I suspect, preparing that justice would have a heart attack if they thought that was the answer they were going to give. Because if they leave the, leave the slightest daylight on that issue, they're going to be inviting violent attack. So they're going to be told, no, 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 you can't. You have to not answer the question. You have to leave no inference that it is open to you to potentially overrule you know, a case like Roe versus Wade. And you can, you can introduce other examples into that, uh, into that equation. But again, that's because it is such a high stakes process, which relates back, I think, to the extraordinary power of the court and the role that it plays in American society and politics. So I mean, that's kind of a. A sad statement there, Bob, that basically if the nominees are honest about their views, that they're going to get destroyed in the confirmation process, and so therefore they basically have to hide their views. Well, I, I, you know, I, I suppose that some of these nominees would say to themselves, look, I'm, when, I'm, when I have the robes on and I'm actually at the Supreme Court, at that point I'll have parties in front of me in briefs and the case will be presented in a certain way. and I might take certainly uh, a more skeptical view uh, of reproductive rights issues than my colleagues on the quote unquote liberal side of the court, but I'll judge it fairly. I mean, there's a way of rationalizing it, but the performative aspects of the confirmation process and the political pressures within it, 
I think make it very, very difficult uh, for justices to be counseled to be anything other than extremely careful. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's a bad thing, though. I mean, I don't think we want nominees sitting there going, up, yep, I'm going to overturn it for a second I get, or no, I would never overturn Roe versus Wade, because I agree with you, Bob. I mean, I think, I mean, Bob is absolutely right on this. <coughs> justices, when they get the papers before them, they may see things differently. And do we want someone who, to, to commit themselves to a position as an appellate court nominee, because it goes both ways. I mean, when Justice Souter was nominated to the Supreme Court, you had the groups, the, the women's rights groups, who put flyers out there saying, vote no on David Souter, women will die. I mean, that was literally, you know, what the debate was then, women will die. And people were convinced that the Supreme Court, with seven justices nominated by Republican presidents, was going to overturn Roe versus Wade. Convinced that battle was done. Well, then look what happened. They didn't. You had three justices coming together, nominated by Republican presidents, who refused to overturn it then. Those three might have done things differently if they had said in their confirmation hearings, oh, I think that, you know, that's, that's yeah, no, we're going to overturn it. Because you're freezing them in that moment in time. Would the Supreme Court have overturned Bowers versus Hardwick and Lawrence versus Texas uh, and struck down sodomy, anti-sodomy laws? Uh, a major ruling for gay rights that paved the way for countless other rulings on gay rights. If those nominees said at the time what they thought about those precedents, maybe not. So I, I don't, I, I kind of reject the idea that we really want them as appellate court judges to say with certainty this is what they think about a specific issue that will come before the court later. Because there are surprises, justices do change their minds, and you know who would have thought a Reagan appointee uh, would refuse to overturn Roe versus Wade and write literally the foundation for some of the most defining and transformative uh, uh, gay rights cases of our time. More, moreover, in private, and I think this is probably true, Bob, that we, we didn't ask, the counsel's office or the Justice Department wouldn't ask the nominee ahead of time, what about this case? How do you feel about this case? We wouldn't do that. Why? Because we're going to be, because the nominee's probably going to be asked questions that were you asked, were you asked by the White House your position on a particular case? So, yeah, we you stay away from it. Try to keep this as neutral as possible. But wouldn't, wouldn't you, if I may ask, yeah, what, wouldn't you agree, General Gonzalez, that one of the reasons you increasingly, you wouldn't ask that question for just the reason you suggested, but there is increasingly processes in place by which an administration so thoroughly vets a candidate they don't feel they need to ask that question? Maybe, perhaps, but there's probably still a desire, maybe something in the back of your mind, maybe there's something there that you may have an open question, but uh, you're, I agree with you. I don't disagree. And, you know, in the case of, you know, Kavanaugh and Barrett, you had a president that said, I am going to nominate people who are going to overrule Roe v. Wade. And in the first opportunity they get, they overrule Roe v. Wade. It seems, I think, to the public, arguably, that there was no <laughs> real uncertainty in anyone's mind, that the president said, I want people to do this. You're successors in the White House Counsel's Office found people to do that, and there they did it the first opportunity they got. Well, I'm sure if you're a nominee, you're not going to reject a possible nomination just because the president has made this public statement, oftentimes during a campaign. Silly things are said during a campaign, so I don't think it makes a difference, quite frankly. And I'd like to think the American public would understand that, but, you know, they oftentimes they don't. No. Um, so can anything be done to change the confirmation process? Let's just end our discussion of the confirmation process with that question. Can we improve it somehow, or is it a lost cause, and we should focus on other reform ideas? Bob, you, you're shaking your head. Well, I, I think it could be improved. I wasn't shaking my head with a sense of the proposition that it will be improved. <laughs> I think it could be in improved. In theory, it could be improved. That would require, of course, a bipartisan agreement in the Congress, um, because you can't just have a majority improving the process against the will of the minority, because then, of course, as soon as the minority becomes a the majority, they'll change it back again. So you would need to have some reinstitution of norms that govern the, comp uh, the confirmation process in the Senate. And there are ways to do that. I think there are obvious things, to my mind, they're obvious, that could be done, which is, for example, to guarantee that every nominee receives a vote, to have time periods when it is expected uh, that 
those votes will occur to ensure that, for example, the investigative process, and there is an FBI-directed investigative process as part of the congressional vetting, <coughs> that that's an even-handed process and that both sides are engaged with the federal government in ensuring that information through the vet is properly received in timely fashion by both sides. Uh, there are all sorts of things that could be done that could reduce the appearance of political gaming and fairness to the nominee and fairness to the public in producing information that's valuable about the nomination. And there are, uh, there have been proposals to that effect uh, there, because there is bipartisan agreement that the process is a sideshow and that it's become increasingly unproductive, if not destructive. But you would need a Congress, uh, and in particular you'd need a Senate uh, that was prepared to engage in serious reform discussions aimed at changing its own rules. What about the filibuster? I didn't hear that on your list. Do you think that needs to be brought back? I'm sorry, but what's the, the filibuster? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, that um, I don't see going back on the current uh, majority vote issue. I don't think that's going to change. I think that we're past that point. I could be wrong about that. So I don't see that as uh, something that either side would be prepared to discuss raising. Jan and, and Judge, do you agree with, with Bob's kind of list of how the process could be improved? Anything? Oh, I do, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, you know, but I, don't, I also agree, sadly, that it, you know, may not. I mean, the Senate Judiciary Committee, I mean, they're like the Hatfields and the McCoys, right? I mean, like, he did it, no, he did it. I mean, I honestly, I have four kids. I often want to say, like, I don't care who started it. Like, be grown-ups. But no, you know, they're caught up in this, um, I mean, kind of ridiculous, you know, who filibustered first? Well, you did appellate court judges. Well, now we're going to do this. It's, you know, they're all, I, I think both sides would conduct themselves almost exactly the same. If there had been a vacancy, uh, in, say, a Biden administration in the last waning days of the presidency, it, I think both sides would have, if the tables had been turned, would have done the same thing. Um, mm. So I agree that there should be reforms. I think, going back to the Dobbs decision and like the earthquake that that was, overturning Roe versus Wade, I think that there was a naive hope, um, of, even among some justices, that the court and the nomination process has become so political because of abortion, because of that one issue. And so much time and energy and money is spent trying to discern how a nominee would vote or discern how the proper nom who's the proper nominee in, in the White House's view should be, that once that issue is taken out of the Supreme Court and returned to the states where the legislatures and the governors can fight over it, that maybe that will cool the temperature down of the nominations process and the hearings. I, I don't, I mean, I don't see that happening. I, 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 it seems like, and maybe 100 years from now it will, but <laughs> certainly in my lifetime, um, I don't see that issue. It's always going to be like, well, we've got to, we need justices who will respect and reassert the rights articulated in Roe versus Wade. I think it's naive to think that the confirmation process is going to cool down because that's a great dogs. point, Jan. Because you know, Justice Scalia always said. The reason, one of the reasons why the court should be originalist is because if it sticks to history and doesn't create new rights and expand rights and do moral philosophy, then the American people will leave us alone. They will not be asking us all of these heated questions during our confirmation hearings because all we're doing is history and law. And Jan, it sounds like you're pessimistic that that's going to be the case, that the confirmation process is going to continue to well, be heated even when they say, listen, we're out of the living constitution business. We're just doing history. No, I, I think because for so long people have become accustomed to looking to the courts to protect their rights. I mean, that's, and that's been also a strategy. I mean, honestly, I mean, you and I were discussing this, Bob. President Obama, uh, you know, saw this. He predicted this. He saw this. He said progressives were making a mistake by putting all their eggs in the court's basket. We've got to change hearts and minds with our elected officials because the court's gonna, he could see the writing on the wall. But for so long, people have become, looked to the courts to, to expand rights or create new rights or protect their rights, uh, even if it's not in the Constitution itself, which of course conservatives say if it wasn't in the text or the original understanding, then you know, you're on your own. Um, so I think that that's a, a change though that is 
something that's that would not happen overnight if it does at all. Yeah, let, Sorry, me, I, let, let me just say that uh, I agree. I think uh, we're not going to see any changes in the Senate. Uh, it's just uh, they're just stuck, quite honestly. And I think what the shenanigans that occurred with respect to the Scalia and the Ginsburg vacancy, uh, I think, was wrong. And uh, I'm, I'm saddened to hear you, you. I'm saddened to hear you say that if it, the tables had been turned, the Democrats would have done the same thing. Well, they pretty much said that they well, would. Before, they, well, they you know, wouldn't before. During, yeah, d well. yeah. What during the Clinton administration, they yeah. were kind of laying the groundwork for that. So I don't know that. And the shenanigans here, we should you know maybe tell the audience the shenanigans here, Judge, oh. are <laughs> are what in particular? I uh, wanted to not give Merrick Garland a hearing. Yeah. Quite honestly. Uh, I thought that that was wrong. I wrote a piece about that. that the president did his job. He nominated a qualified individual to be on the Supreme Court. The Senate failed to do its job. That was wrong. And then Amy Coney Barrett, I mean, there's a vacancy in the last just a few months before the end of Donald Trump's term. And um, McConnell did what he said was wrong, would have been wrong before. That's, that, again, that further politicizes the process, quite frankly, in addition to the actual confirmation hearing, the way the Senate conducted those two vacancies was, was shameful. And so maybe one way to kind of summarize where we are with the confirmation process is this, that you know, the justices aren't doing anything wrong by deciding these cases the way they're deciding them, but because of the way the politicians have manipulated the game, it looks bad to the public when the Supreme Court does certain things. When you have a president that says, I want this precedent overturned, when you have a majority leader in the Senate that's kind of gaming the system to get votes on the president's people and not votes for the other side's people, um, it looks to the public like you've manipulated an outcome. Even though the justices, they're just following what they think is the right way to interpret the Constitution, how they got there seems a little shady to the American people. Is that, is that a, maybe a fair way to summarize with, why the, the approvals has dropped some? With, if, if I may, with, with yes. one edit, which is, I, yes, I think the politicians uh, or the political process uh, creates unfortunate pressures and appearances for the institutions. I do think that when we talked about this earlier, and I want to come back to it, Justices do have to, without, again, surrendering their commitment to the rule of law, I don't think it's a black and white situation, nonetheless be sensitive to uh, what's taking place outside the courthouse and to the way particular decisions are made. Now, Justice, uh, Chief Justice uh, Roberts attempted in Dobbs to point into some compromise direction that would not require overruling the precedent. One imagines, uh, for a variety of reasons, that that was driven largely by concern with the institutional effects or the impact on the institution of directly overruling Dobbs, particularly in the circumstances that you suggest. Whether one is persuaded by his suggestion or not, I think that is an important impulse to think somewhat widely. It wouldn't happen all the time. It wouldn't happen for many of the cases that the court decides but to think about the wider potential impact on the institution about how it goes about doing its job. So I wouldn't want to acquit the justices of some responsibility for this. I see, interesting. Let me ask about some other possible reform ideas to the extent that you know, we're not happy with how things are right now. Um, you know, the confirmation process might be a lost cause. Maybe we can <laughs> make some improvements there. Um, you know, the media, um, we think maybe the Supreme Court reporters and the mainstream media are doing a good job. Um, I'm not sure what we can do to improve those who fall outside that category and their, and their reporting. But I do want to turn to some of the ideas in the Biden Commission report. You know, one that has a lot of commentators in favor is to enact I guess it would have to come from Congress, a ethics code that the Supreme Court justices must follow. I, my understanding is there is such a statutory ethics code that the lower federal judges have to follow, but it does not apply right now to the US Supreme Court. So one idea is to expand the 
ethical code to also encompass the Supreme Court justices. Is this something that could have any positive effect on where we are? Anyone? Anyone in favor of the ethics code? Yes, Bob. I'm voting for it. Oh, you're I, voting for I, it? I, yeah. I, I would support uh, it. Unanimous. Also. Yes. Unanimous support. Well, Why? they've been working. I mean, you know, they've been yeah. working on it up there at the court for four, five or six years now, so we don't really know what's happened with that. Why effort. would they not have a code? Everyone yeah. else does. I mean, and it why would, not? If the, and it, it would also like take away a major point of criticism. No That's kidding. why it's like an unforced, it you know, it's like a self-inflicted wound by the court not having What done. would it change? What are they doing now anything. that they wouldn't be able to do if there's an ethics code? It wouldn't, it would, to, I don't think it would change anything. What it would do is take away a talking point that the court doesn't have an ethics code. It's and just look, an appearances they're out, they're thing. All these ethics Total violations. appearances. Could be, particularly if the court enforces it, so it, that rule. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the, the court would be the only body able to enforce mm -hmm. the ethical code. And so your view is, if they're going to enforce themselves, their own violations, then well, it's but, not going to change much. But it wouldn't hurt them. So that, uh, yeah. Even more, it wouldn't hurt them. And so Maybe why not do it? I think it helps the court. I, I agree. It's a question of institutional accountability. I think uh, most major public and private uh, organizations, uh, private organizations with huge potential public impact in the way they operate, have ethics codes. And there doesn't seem to be any reason why the Supreme Court wouldn't have one. I'm not persuaded that um, the ethics code should be prescribed by Congress in the first instance, but I think the court needs to be urged to adopt one. And I think that it would make a difference because at that point, uh, there would be available and visible to the public standards by which the court's conduct could be uh, potentially evaluated. And right now, though the court says it consults the lower court code, uh, just precisely what that means you know, what, to what weight it gives particular requirements in the lower court code, all of that is unknown. And the mere fact that the court isn't prepared to submit to an ethics code or subject itself to an ethics code, I think as uh, Jan suggests, is a flashpoint. So I could think it could only be helpful both as a matter of appearance and as a matter of substance. And I agree, it takes one more potential irritant out of the debate. And just you know, for our audience that may be unfamiliar with what these ethics codes prescribe for judges, I think the most significant provision is usually a provision that says you're not allowed to sit in a case if you have a conflict of interest. And so um, that is probably the most significant provision that would be added to what the Supreme Court does now, is now there would be some regulation that required them to leave a case if they had a conflict of interest. I remember when I clerked for Justice Scalia, there was a big question about whether he had to step aside in a case that involved Dick Cheney because he went hunting with Dick Cheney. And he wrote a, an 18-page hmm. opinion explaining why he didn't have to do that. Um, now, if there were an ethics code, would anything have been different about that? I'm not sure. But um, at the very least, I think you're right. It probably would take away some talking points. And the Scalia example, and one before him, I think was Chief Justice Rehnquist also had occasion to write an extensive defense of a non-recusal decision. I think that the mere fact that justices would, in fact, give reasons, and those reasons would be transparent. Right now, they're not required to give reasons. But an ethics code that compelled them to at least give in general terms the reason for the recusal or the reasons to not recuse creates a kind of common law of recusal and it enhances the court's accountability to the public. Okay. Yeah, so sometimes we just have to, you know, you'll see a justice, they're not on the bench for an argument or they're not participating. We're, we're trying to figure out why. You know, they don't say, so they, well, do they have stock in that company or do they have, so it's, I, I think that it, I absolutely agree with that, that that would be useful. More transparency, of course, is good. And, and Bob, remind me, did the Biden Commission endorse um, promulgating an ethics code for the court? Yes. Now, the, the Biden Commission was not charged with making recommendations, but it definitely, at various points in the report, pointed in the direction of what it thought was the most productive outcome to the debate. And on the question of judicial ethics codes, it stated that it was, quote, not obvious <laughs> why the court would not have an ethics code. It also noted uh, a consensus among observers of the court that justices, their dependents and their spouses should not hold publicly traded securities. 
So there's a lot of material in that report that both supports a general notion of the code and speaks to some of the specifics. Excellent. Let's talk about another reform idea that um, the commission was mixed on, if I remember correctly, and that is, should we do something about life tenure? You know, federal judges in the United States are pretty much unique in the world in that they can serve until they die if they want to. And in modern times, we're living very long, and those tenures can be very, very long. And there is, I think, a fair amount of support among scholars and some commentators to take away life tenure for the Supreme Court. I think it would probably have to be done by constitutional amendment, uh, so it would be hard to do. But should we think about trying to do it? What does the panel think about that reform idea? Well, I mean, that's a fairly significant change. I was talking to my friend, Professor Bloomstein, about the fact that we are in a very closely divided country. So those kind of structural changes, um, I think, are going to be, would be very difficult to achieve, quite frankly. And would be met with deep suspicion. Oh, no question. Even if it were something that was... Suspicion by whom? Well, if you're trying to term limit judges right now, it would be met with suspicion by conservatives. But what about future justices? If you're trying to justices? do it on the other side, it would be, I what think about the, that again... Just the future justices. So the, the ones that are on there now, they get their life tenure. Any, so, so one proposal, uh, I think one that has probably the most support of all the proposals I've seen, is that each justice gets an 18-year term. And the terms would be staggered. So every two years, one of the nine would, be, uh, would uh, have their term end, and the president would be able to nominate a replacement basically every two years. So every president gets two nominees every four-year term. And one of the reasons why this has a lot of support, I would say, among scholars and commentators is because they think it uh, lowers the stakes of the confirmation process. You know, right now, we don't know when we're going to get a new vacancy. So every vacancy is crucially important. If we knew that we got a new vacancy every two years on the clock, we wouldn't treat each nomination as the potential end of the world as we know it. Uh, so, I mean, is that such a bad idea? I, I, don't, I don't support it. You don't support uh, it. I think even under that scenario, every vacancy is crucial. Every vacancy on that court is crucial, no matter how, whether there are term, term limits or not. I fear also that if you have term limits, uh, opponents of the president, uh, they're going to know when there's going to be a vacancy, and they'll be better prepared, quite frankly. More time to, to do op uh, opposition research, and I, I just think it'll make the confirmation hearing actually more political, quite honestly. Well, I worry you, about that. Yeah, you know, and when you think about how the public views the court and how we should think about the court, and I mean, I firmly believe that this court is not political in the sense that we think Congress is. It is a court with nine really smart people who are in this epic struggle over how to interpret the Constitution, either in a conservative way or a liberal way, and that is a result of presidential elections because presidents get to nominate justices, the Senate confirms them, so the bottom line is elections matter and people should vote. But the court, so the court right now is in the struggle over where it is headed in terms of the, the way that they believe the Constitution should be interpreted. If you add term limits like that, I, one concern would be that you then really do have Biden judges and Bush judges and Clinton judges and Obama judges because every president, every president would then have his judge. And so then the concern would be that the decisions would actually look even more political. So I, I, th I think that you have to, these are very difficult fixes why we've not seen anything sensitive in you know, many years uh, changing the court, why court packing has been a disaster when it was <laughs> proposed, why I don't think adding justices to the court is something that is going to happen. Um, but I do think that there are reforms that we could say. I think the court could do a better job of explaining its opinions, uh, writing summaries that people can read on their own. People, like the public, 
you know, people like to, you want to go and read an opinion. You want to know, go back to the sources and just see what the court's saying. I don't believe the media. I don't believe my, my you know, the politicians. Let me see what the court's saying. The court makes it really difficult for people to do that. They write these long opinions. You know, the summary is pretty dense. It's written for law professors. I mean, I'm a lawyer myself. I've covered the court for almost 30 years. And it's hard to figure out, for me, sometimes, quickly what the court is saying. So I think the court could do a better job in communicating what its rulings are and what they're based on uh, to the American people. They could be more accessible with the American people. Uh, they could allow, instead of having every argument in Washington, something that's been proposed is they could mm -hmm. do the circuit writings like they used to, hold arguments in Nashville uh, you know, every five years so that people could come see the justices. Because it's impressive when you watch those justices on the bench during arguments at work. They were in, a, like I said, like this titanic struggle over ideas and interpretations and philosophies. And it is a branch of government that now is divided like the rest of them, I agree, but that does still work, even if you disagree with it or agree with it. They're, they're getting their business done. And I think the more the American people can see that and access their opinions, um, the better it would be for the Supreme Court. Bob, well, we got two <coughs> ideas there. Life tenure, get rid of it, yes. and so, Supreme Court needs to get out there and... Totally agree with the latter, and I have to say I, I, I separate myself a little bit from my co-panelists here. I strongly support term limits for the court. You do? I do. I strongly Well, do. I don't say I oppose them. Oh. I just say it, ra it does raise other issues. It raises their, their complexities I, I and, and how does reform... I can't say yes, uh, th that's fair. Uh, the complexities, uh, there are always complexities in these reform uh, programs, and yes, it's, it would almost, in my view, both prudently and successfully have to be achieved by constitutional amendment. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen in my lifetime. Could happen in my children's lifetime. Could happen in my grandchildren's lifetime. But what is, to me, the baseline consideration is there is no other political institution, and as you pointed out, it's not true in any democracy, uh, no apex court in any other, um, uh, I'm thinking 27 country survey, but I'm not going to be able to cite it off the top of my head here, that has neither term limits nor age limits. Doesn't exist. So here you have a court with this monumental impact on the lives of people that take up issues that have tremendous significance socially and politically and culturally. And there are nine people who sit uh, for longer than ever. I, uh, the, I think up to the, by 1970, I think the average term the justice served for like 16 years. Now it's closer to three decades. Some justices have served longer. It's concentrated power of a kind that typically <coughs> our system of government does not embrace. And I think that that is severely problematic. Um, I think that there are, uh, it is true, I think all of the points that were raised uh, here, um, and those disagreements are reflected in the Biden Commission report, it is true there are complexities of execution and design. There are likely to be suspicions raised by term limits, although, as you point out, there's a grandfathering principle that could apply. Uh, there are all sorts of mechanisms that would have to be written into any kind of term limit proposal. But how do you support, first of all, that kind of concentration of power? He asked rhetorically. Some people would say, well, I can, but I, I, I'm suspicious of it. And an outcome in which, for example, Jimmy Carter who was president for four years, has zero Supreme Court appointments. Donald Trump, who was president for four years, has three Supreme Court appointments. I think that's a distortion in the way uh, that we think about uh, the operation of the democratic process as it translates into the operations of the court. And I think that we ought to seriously, we ought to move toward really serious consideration of term limits, which again, some have argued can be affected by statute. I, I don't think that's sustainable, either as a matter of law most likely, but certainly as a matter of public acceptance, but by constitutional amendment, which as I said, could eventually come about. Judge, do you want any rebuttal on this term limits question? No, I, I've, I've said my piece. I, I don't disagree, quite frankly, but I, but I do see the complexities of, of doing it. Uh, and I also, in addition to not having term limits or age limits, we do have a constitution that is extremely hard to amend. So that, that would be another argument uh, for what's being proposed here. But um, I'm still with myself. You know, just on the, 
On the term limit question, uh, you know, I've generally been sympathetic to, to Bob's arguments, and I have liked the 18-year term proposal. Um, but uh, are we okay? <laughs> wow. The, there we the go. The lights are term limited. <laughs> <laughs> They're on a timer, too. But, you know, I was really impressed during the last presidential election of the Trump-appointed lower court judges that repeatedly dismissed the Trump litigation claims that the election was stolen. Uh, I, I thought it was very impressive that people that the president himself had put on the bench were willing to tell the president, no, these claims are basically frivolous. And I wonder if they would have done that had they not had life tenure. You know, the founding generation was obsessed with judicial independence. And the way they thought they could guarantee judicial independence was life tenure. And I thought we had a pretty good demonstration of the merit of their view during the last election. And so it, it's weakened my support somewhat for, for term limits, honestly. Can I please? Can I weaken your going the other way? <laughs> Buck uh, me up a little bit. I, yeah. I, I, it was you're, you're, there's there's a lot to be said for you know extended tenure. Um, we're talking obviously now here just term limits for the Supreme Court of the United States, not for the lower courts. I would say on the Supreme Court, 18 years is a very long time. It's a pretty long time. Uh, but I would also say the one false positive maybe is, and I say this and I know Republicans who will back me up on this, so this is not just a Democrat speaking, the lawsuits that were brought after the election were not what I call masterpieces of legal right, reasoning, right. well supported they by were facts. Yeah. So a judge who was prepared to sustain those suits, <laughs> we're not gonna find many, at least with law degrees, who would have been prepared to do that. Fair enough. Um, Let's go back to another idea that Jan raised, and I think the judge mentioned this as well, is the Supreme Court justice getting out there, talking to people, explaining their decisions uh, in other fora besides simply the Supreme Court chamber. You know, there has been some criticism of the justices becoming too much of celebrities that they're going giving speeches everywhere, they're writing books, they're getting big advances on their books, that there's kind of a celebrity culture surrounding the justices. Some of this is tied in people's minds to the Federalist Society, which is a conservative libertarian legal organization that has supported many of the recent justices' nominations. They go to these big gala dinners and they give speeches and and they feel like celebrities. And this, this is infectious to them, and it drives them to write a lot of separate opinions where they are ideologically pure, so their fan bases will uh, you know, increase uh, in, in number. Uh, is there anything to this argument that the justices have become celebritized? Well, I think you left out the most obvious one, which is Justice Ginsburg, notorious RBG. And there is some, um, there is some sense and there has been some commentary that she became somewhat enamored with her stature as the notorious RBG and uh, stayed on the court much longer than she should have. Obviously, had she retired sooner, um, hmm. the entire Supreme Court would be different. And, there may well have not been Dobbs. Um, so there, there is, I think, uh, some sense that, yes, they have become, quote, celebrities in a way that's quite um, harmful to the institution. But my, what I think is useful for the justices to do, and it's what Justice Breyer did so well, and why I think he's really, um, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll miss him personally, um, because and I think that maybe Justice Jackson will do more of this, uh, maybe Justice Barrett will, Justice Kagan, is Justice Breyer would go out and talk to rooms like this, where you guys are smart people, you're educated, and you're interested in court, and then this country, and the future of this country. And he would talk about the court, the role of the court, civics, um, and he spent a lot of time doing that. And I think that's really important, not about their opinions or who they are as celebrities, but just in like talking to, to groups of informed, educated people like you guys are, or you know, law schools, 
um, colleges and universities about the way the court works and the role of the courts. And you know, he would have debates. I moderated many of them. He and Scalia would debate the proper rule of law, proper rule of um, constitutional interpretation. Uh, and then, you know, I remember one I did in Washington between Scalia and um, Breyer, and you know, they have this heated debate about whether the Constitution's living or dead. And you know, the crowd, we, it was fascinating for everyone in the audience, and it was this big debate. And then, you know, the lights go off, and, and Scalia goes, let's go get a burger. And they're like, all right, so they walk off to go get dinner together. You know, those are the things that I think can really show people more than like what the politicians are saying about the court or the groups are saying about the decisions. The court could do more of that and a better job of that. I agree that there's a, there's a mystery about the court and about the justices. On the other hand, I also, I, you know, I, I think uh, to go speak for, to groups like the Federal Society, I don't think that that's very helpful to the image of the court, the reputation of the court, but to groups like this one, I think that's that's perfectly. I think not only is it a good thing. I think it's almost expected. I, it's something they ought to be doing. Quite frankly, is there any pair of current justices that engages in these little debates like Scalia and Breyer used to? We don't see that anymore. They're just doing one-off speeches. Maybe there speeches. will be. You know, yeah. maybe Justice Barrett will have a debate with Justice Kagan. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's not. Um, I mean, we have you know, the court. You know, it's, it's like a photograph, you know? I mean, like uh, the old Polaroid cameras, right? You know, like, remember those? I mean, are they, I don't think they even make them anymore. Or maybe they make <laughs> retro ones now. But, you know, it takes time for that photo to come into focus. And so, you know, we still, this is still a pretty new court with new justices. Mm -hmm. We have a brand new justice, the first African-American female justice, uh, who I think is gonna have a very active role and be a prominent voice on that court. So, you know, we'll, We'll see, like next year and the following years, um, who does have the influence. Justice Breyer, for example, had tremendous influence on the Supreme Court with conservative justices, or one in particular. Bob, do you have any comments on the celebritization of the justices and getting out there more and talking to the I public? think getting out there is good in yeah. the kind of debate that Jan was describing with the burger at the end, I think is very helpful to people to hear about mm -hmm. the court and to see the justices coming out and being accountable and helpful to the public in understanding the court. I mean, the celebritization gives me pause. It can go too far, can create pressures, I think, be perfectly human pressures for a justice to become overly attuned mm -hmm. to the expectations of what has been referred to here as the fan base. <laughs> so I think that's a matter of judgment and hopefully the justices will exercise that judgment wisely. So let me go to a, a more controversial reform proposal that I think had, had less support in the Biden commission than the term limit proposal and that is increasing the number of justices on the Supreme Court. This is very popular on the progressive left, I think it's fair to say. Uh, is there any support on the panel for that idea that why nine? Why not 13? Why not 15? Any, any thoughts on that, Bob? Speaking just for myself, I've never been keen on what proponents call court expansion and opponents call court packing. Um, I don't see what the end point is. That's the problem. I don't really, you can imagine it being proposed for a variety of reasons and the commission report re rehearses what they might be. One of them is a short-term immediate redress to the norm violations we saw in the confirmation process. Uh, what Judge Gonzalez referred to as the shenanigans. Well, yeah, what, what, uh, yeah, exactly, Attorney General Gonzalez referred to as the shenanigans, um, and that this would be a one-time effort to redress that. I don't think there is such a thing as a one-time effort once you cross that particular line, so I think we just would have a cycle of retribution and continued efforts by the majority each time to add justices as they thought the composition to their liking of the court required. So I think that's an issue. And then there, there are other arguments that have been made for court expansion, more help for the court. That was an argument Roosevelt made in 1937 that the court could use some help. It was viewed by and large as disingenuous. I think it's not really persuasive. Diversification of the court, that's a laudable goal. I don't think it would be accomplished effectively through court expansion. So I have to say, I, I'm not keen on that as a solution. Can I say something about your, your reference to my use of the word shenanigans? <laughs> uh, 
uh, just to be clear, uh, certainly Senator McConnell had the authority to do what he did. Uh, let's all recognize mm -hmm. that. The other thing I would like to say is uh, certainly with respect to the appointment of Neil Gorsuch, Neil worked for me when I was the Attorney General. I, so I, you know, this is nothing, no slight against Neil Gorsuch. I, I'm glad he's on the court. Very good. Any Although I will say, I, 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 if you think about where does it end, on that Senate Judiciary Committee, good God, we'd have 79 justices 20 yeah. years from now. <laughs> they, they would just, you know, the Republicans do this, the Democrats are going to do that, and well, we're going to do this. Yeah, yeah. You're right. <laughs> absolutely. You're absolutely right. Yeah, we'd have right. To build, next thing you know, we got a new Supreme Court building, like your airport here. They're going to have to have another terminal on to And if you're worried about the potential perception of the court that it's a uh, public perception of the court's completely politicized and under the control of political handlers, it seems to be that outcome is, is the worst of all possible yeah. outcomes. Yeah. So no support for expanding the number of justices, no. it sounds like, on this panel. Is there anything else that you think we can do to improve the current situation? We've talked about some ideas for the confirmation process. We've talked about turning to more trustworthy sources of information. We've talked about the Supreme Court justices you know, making their decisions a little easier to understand or at least putting something out there that summarizes them, getting out there and talking to the public uh, outside of Washington, D.C. We've talked about the ethics code. I think there's pretty much unanimous support for all of these ideas. There's some mixed support for, for term limits. Is there anything else that, that we can do to make things better that we haven't talked about? Any further ideas? Or we cover, yes, Bob. I, I certainly think the court, and it's aware that this is a problem, has to um, address the misuse of the emergency docket, sometimes ah. referred to as the shadow docket, yes. in which basically the court um, operates in a kind of an emergency setting but winds up deciding cases short of full deliberation with full briefing and full argument, and there are questions about whether or not what they do in an emergency ruling has precedential effect. Now the justices themselves are complaining about uses by the other, by the majority of the, in what, what might be the majority in a particular case of the emergency docket. These are the things that it's really important that the court get a handle on. It's like judicial ethics. Why have that become a problem for you, where it appears that you're short-circuiting normal processes and raising a whole host of questions about why you're going about doing things that way? The public's not going to be engaged with that. There's no reason why the public would be, but I think it would make a difference. Uh, if the court accepted um, the need to manage its own internal affairs in a way that um, insulated it from the kind of criticism that then gets amplified beyond the groups and beyond the Congress to the public at large, which hears there's one more problem with the way the court operates. This emergency docket, for those unfamiliar with it, it, it uh, most often deals with questions of whether a lower court decision should be stayed while the parties seek Supreme Court review on the merits, or whether a stay that was entered by a lower court should be lifted while the parties seek further review in the US Supreme Court. And so it's usually a decision about whether to stay a decision or not stay it in the lower courts. But in deciding whether to stay or not stay, you can end up deciding a lot. And the court has been criticized for using this emergency docket to act for or against the stay more frequently than they have in the past. Jan, Judge, do you? Well, the, the problem is because then they're deciding it so quickly, there's no argument. You know, most people don't even know. So, you know, we cover, for example, uh, next week there's two, two big arguments. So, you know, we'll do stories on those and they'll, We'll talk about them for the next couple of months until the decision comes down. But in this quote shadow docket, it's shadowy. You know, they do it. There's no <laughs> argument. It's just done. Uh, I, I agree with Bob. I think you know, the justices are aware of that. You've seen Justice Kagan being pretty critical of this. And I think we're seeing there's been some cases recently where some of the conservatives, Justice Barrett, um, the chief, where they're like, no, we're not, you know. So I, I don't, it's something to watch, but I do think that it's something that. As you said, I agree with you. They were aware of that, and I think they're trying to get a better handle on it. Some of it was also because of the pandemic, and it was all weird up there. And you know, they had arguments 
you know, over the phone. I remember Justice Breyer at one time I went up and went to the bathroom in the middle of them. It's just been kind of a crazy time <laughs> up there. So um, flush the toilet. And, oh, it's not good. But, um, we've so all now been they're there. Back. You know, we've I mean, all the court been. is back. You know, they're hearing arguments again um, on the bench. The public can attend. Uh, the, they've just announced yesterday that the court's going to be open again during non-argument days, which is great, so that school groups and tourists can now go back inside the Supreme Court, um, I, which I believe the more people can see the court, the better it is for the court and the country. Uh, so, you know, I think, I, I do think we're seeing that sense that they're maybe pulling back on some of those cases now as well, too. Yeah, I agree with Jan and Bob. It's hard to be sympathetic with the court. I mean, only handling 60 or 70 cases a year, so, I mean, they probably have time to and, you know, they take <laughs> dig in on some more. They're off from July through October. Maybe that's why they don't want term limits. Pretty good job. <laughs> One I do remember John Roberts when he was a young lawyer in the Justice Department. We came across some of the papers during his confirmation hearings, and he was supporting. He'd written a memo that supported term limits. Mm -hmm. So during his, um, of course, during his, conf his own confirmation hearing to be a Supreme Court justice, he, of course, is asked about this memo uh, where he seems to be saying that term limits are a great idea. And he says in kind of his like kind of dry deadpan humor he has, he's like, well, it looks a lot differently when you're sitting in this chair. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's very nice. You know, one innovation that came out of the pandemic phone call, conference call arguments is now the court, um, it used to be a free for all during oral arguments where for 30 minutes, whichever justice could interrupt the other justices more often got to ask the most questions. But now uh, the chief justice goes around and each justice is given an opportunity to ask whatever questions they want. And then when they're done, then they move to, a new, to, to another justice. There still is some free for all a time, but each justice gets solo time if they want it to ask questions. And it's okay <coughs> if the arguments go longer than 30 minutes if justices need more time to ask their questions. And I must say, I think it works a lot better. Um, because, you know, Justice Thomas used to never ask a question, and now he asks questions all the time. Justice Scalia used to be the only one that could ask any questions, because he was the most willing to interrupt everybody else. And now you have a lot more diversity of participation up there. So I actually think it really works well. Um, I'm happy they do it. I'd be interested in what Jen and uh, General Gonzalez think. I have to say the other thing that just as an observer of the court, I don't think serves the court that well. And I, by the way, favor uh, televised proceedings of uh, oral argument. That's what I was going to ask for a reform. Why aren't we talking about that? Oh, I, I think we too. should have it. I think we, and, and I, I think that the audio experiments have been fine, but I don't see any reason. Um, state Supreme Court, uh, mm -hmm. in many states, uh, appearances are, or arguments are televised. I think it's a very good educational instrument. And I'm not persuaded that you know it's going to encourage justices and lawyers to grandstand. There are a lot of reasons why I don't think it's going to get any worse if, if uh, than the grandstanding we sometimes see <clears throat> uh, if it's televised. The I find the the staccato interruptions of the council to be extremely irritating. I don't think it's helpful to the public. I think it looks combative and adversarial and disrespectful. You know, let the councils. End. Now they do have a rule now. I believe that they get their two minutes at the beginning. At the beginning. So at least they can get the argument out of their mouths. <laughs> which originally, someone would come up and say, you know, justice, if it pleases the court and whatever, and they get one sentence into it, and they'd be chopped up promptly with questions. But I, but I think even now in the back and forth, it's very difficult uh, for people who are not familiar with the case. Um, and maybe even sometimes people who are familiar with the case to follow what's taking place. And I find it performative. I really do. I don't think it's necessary to the justices' understanding. Of this, but maybe your views on that would be different. Well, Former Supreme Court justice yourself. Or, yeah, I, I don't think we're going to see that change occur, quite honestly. I think uh, justices want to have the discretion to, if they have a question they want answered, they'll ask it when they, you know. I, so I, 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 it can, you know, obviously a justice can decide, well, I'm going to wait for this point to be made by counsel before asking this question, but I, I don't see any kind of change occurring there. With respect to televised hearings, uh, I think it's only that was a, a big sigh. Well, I just think it's only a matter of time, whether I like it or not. I think it's only a matter of time. It's going to happen. Well, why don't you like it? I'm not quite sure, <laughs> <laughs> uh, honestly. Uh, 
right. maybe because I'm just used to not being televised, <laughs> Fear of the unknown. sitting as a judge. Yes. I, you know, but it, but I, I can see the advantages. I, it's all about educating the public, honestly, and so well, transparency so in government is 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 always a good thing. And so much of what the court does is really boring. I mean, they've really only got four or five. So I think that, you know, because we only cover the contentious, controversial four or five cases a year, you know, it, it suggests that the court is in this, like, horrible, you know, at each other's throats all the time. Where I mean, most of the cases are, you know, these complex, intricate, complicated tax cases or ERISA or, you know, it's just so I think that it also would give a better picture of what, the court actually does, but as far as arguments go, I mean, I, you know, I, I think that's why Justice Thomas for so long never asked any questions. He just thought it's like a food fight up there, and all the other justices were wanting to just interrupt each other and hear themselves talk. And so I agree, um, Brian, with you that like one of the best things about the way the court kind of went through the pandemic was that Justice Thomas now because they go in order of seniority and he's the most senior asked a question the first question and they're good questions mm. being the justices refer to them they'll say well as justice thomas said and i think it was unfortunate for justice thomas that he decided not to ask questions for a long time because he gave the false impression that he just wasn't up to the job i mean justice thomas is a brilliant jurist you may disagree with him on the law he never followed justice scalia it was the other way around uh, if you go back and look at the papers of Harry Blackman, there's a lot of misunderstanding about Clarence Thomas. You may think his decisions are absolutely horrible, um, but those are his, that's, those are his product of his mind working through those legal theories, and his questions are as well. So that is one positive thing that I think the public gets a, a more accurate picture uh, of Justice Thomas. Well, that was very nice, Jan. Thank you. And I got the signal that we are out of time. But I want to thank everyone for coming this morning. And I want to tell everybody that <laughs> Vanderbilt's next Unity Project event will be held in person on Wednesday, December 7th at 6 p.m. in the Scarrett Bennett Center, not far from here. The event is entitled Then and Now, Presiding in Polarized Times. It will be a discussion between journalists and co-authors Peter Baker and Susan Glasser along with Pulitzer Prize winning presidential historian John Meacham surrounding the legacy of the Trump presidency oh, and the midterm elections potential impact on our country's fractured politics. You can register at vanderbilt.edu slash unity. And on this point of our next panel, I would highly recommend another book by one of our current panelists. Bob has a book called After Trump Out that sounds like it'd be perfect for our next panel. Maybe you should come back. Um, but another book that you could pick up as part of your Christmas list. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.